Okay, I'm Harriet Ritvo. I'm a professor of history at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So, concern with kinds runs through the literature of the 19th century. Sometimes this concern was existential, as when Tennyson famously worried that nature wasn't careful of the type since scarped cliff and quarried stone showed that a thousand types are gone and all shall go. It's from In Memoriam. But more often, it reflected puzzlement or maybe more violent emotions about where particular kinds began and ended or how to tell one kind from another. So Lewis Carroll, for example, obliquely broached many of the underlying scientific and philosophical problems. In chapter five of Alice in Wonderland, the pigeon identifies Alice as a serpent, first on anatomical grounds, her long neck, and then on behavioral ones, her confessed predilection for eating eggs. Now when she protests this taxonomic placement, the pigeon firmly asserts the precedence of function over form. The pigeon says, you're looking for eggs, I know that well enough, and what does it matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent? Alice, however, clings to anatomy as the correct determinant of classification, as she demonstrates in the following chapter when she warns the duchess's baby, if you're going to turn into a pig, my dear, I'll have nothing more to do with you. Another, another novelist, Charles Kingsley, spun social exclusion a bit differently in Water Babies, where a, sno a snobbish salmon uh, reluctantly acknowledges um, his re relation, or her relation, I believe, to uh, the lowly trout she, who that she critiques for laziness in failing to migrate, which has caused them to become ugly and brown and spotted and small. But even this remote and disparaged kinship carries threats that go well beyond mere mortification. She's particularly horrified to learn that uh, there's a possibility of a reproductive breach of the species barrier. She learns that one of them, a trout, proposed to a lady salmon, although she's reassured, possibly unrealistically, to hear from a gentleman salmon that there are very few ladies of our race who would degrade themselves by listening to such a creature. Now in the island of Dr. Moreau, H.G. Wells' protagonist uses surgery to overcome any such reluctance to hybridize on the part of his experimental subjects. Now, of course, the producers and consumers of literary works were not alone in their fascination with these kind of topics. Although novelists and poets may have presented the issues raised by taxonomy in their most attractive and compelling form, they didn't make the most authoritative pronouncements on such controversy. Scientists and naturalists had been worrying about how to define species in the abstract and how to recognize and delimit them in the flesh, and also fighting about these kind of issues for a long time, although the Google Ngram viewer suggests that the phrases species problem and species question only emerged in a significant way during the 19th century. Um, this, is, this, is, um, this is species question. If you do one for species problem, the time is shifted a bit towards the uh, present. Now, the reasons that species has been a persistent source of trouble aren't too difficult to discern. The species is the anchor of all the more or less elaborate taxonomic systems that have been devised to arrange and organize and explain the diversity and number of uh, kinds of living organisms. Their early variations reflected differences of more or less learned opinions, and these systems have continued to alter in response to the increase of biological knowledge. Thus, the stripped-down set of nested taxonomical categories that are listed on the first page of Linnaeus's Systema Naturae, that's from, uh, that's the, from the 1758 edition, which is still the starting point for uh, animal taxonomy and nomenclature for plants. It's his, 
species Plantarum uh, a few years earlier. So kingdom class order genus species is readily recognizable as the forerunner of the standard list promulgated in 20th century biology classrooms, what I learned in high school, uh, kingdom phylum class order family genus species. But in recent decades, the, its core meaning has been modified by the replacement of traditional, uh, the traditional phylogenetic tree by the cladogram. Um, let's see, have I got the right one? Uh, well, that's, that's the old one. And there's the new one for apes, um, or yeah, pr primates, that is to say. Um, and the relation uh, among the, the categories has been complicated by the pr pr proliferation of taxa at all levels, including but not limited to suborder, infraorder, parvorder, superfamily, subfamily, et cetera, et cetera. But in all these alternative schemas, the species has remained the foundational taxon, while all the higher categories, along with the lower ones, like subspecies and varieties, are inherently relational. That is, for example, order and family are normally not defined except with reference to the categories that they contain or are contained by. The species ostensibly refers to a group of organisms that actually exists uh, independently of any taxonomic system. But I should emphasize ostensibly. It's not necessary to go further than Darwin to see the difficulties inherent in such a bald formulation, one that assumes that species are easy or even possible to delimit his theory of evolution by natural selection, like any evolutionary theory actually, dissolved the chronological boundaries between parent species and their offsprings. And he also addressed the porousness of synchronic boundaries. So the second chapter of the or on the origin of species is devoted to variation under nature. And it includes an extended account of the difficulty of distinguishing between species and varieties. That is to say whether a particular form deserves, uh, which is an interesting word too, to be ranked as a species. So after weighing the criteria for such decisions and citing the divergent opinions of learned experts, Darwin opted for an explanation that I think privileges social construction over biological analysis. So he said, I have been struck with the fact that if any plant or animal in a state of nature be highly useful to man or from any cause attract his attention, varieties of it will almost universally be found recorded. These varieties, moreover, will often be ranked by some authors as species. In other words, to quote an old movie, if you build it, they will come. So that's about baseball, but still I think it applies. Um, anyway. But these abstract boundary issues aren't the concerns that have been most troublesome historically as the people who needed to deploy the species category have attempted to define it. And it, it's worth just saying that anyone who studies particular organisms has to assume, at least for the purposes of discussion, that those individual species exist or existed no matter how nuanced their understanding is of the problems that are implicit in that assumption. I mean, if you don't have words, you can't talk about anything. So the OED, which locates the first use of the term species to refer to animal or plant kinds in the early 17th century, notes very prudently that the exact definition of a species and the criteria by which species are to be dis distinguished especially in relation to genera or variety, have been the subject of much discussion. But most dictionaries are less circumspect, defining zoological and botanical species as groups of organisms that can produce fertile offspring. And this is also th the definition offered by many naturalist and introductory biology texts, even if it's modified to accommodate species that are separated by geography or behavior rather than by reproductive physiology or to acknowledge that there are some obvious exceptions, that is distinct species that produce fertile offspring like the wolf and the coyote, or the bison and the domestic cow. But the more intensely people think about these matters, the more complicated 
they tend to find them. So among biologists and allied academics, the species question or, or problem is still a very live issue or set of issues. And if scientific and philosophical arguments about such matters continue to be strenuous, the definition of species also has consequences for non-specialists as well as for the organisms that it classifies. So when they're dis transposed from the journals and conferences of experts uh, to the less rarefied discourse of the larger culture in which science is embedded, arguments about species begin to overlap with taxonomies based on different criteria. For example, the categories of wild and domesticated have been taxonomically potent at least since the emergence of modern classification systems in the 18th century, and they were socially and economically potent for centuries and indeed for millennia uh, before then. So most versions of modern systematic taxonomy have enshrined these categories in the form of nomenclature, emphasizing the value added by domestication with Latinate binomials, so that Bos taurus, the cow, is the offspring of the extinct ancestral Bos primigenius, the aurochs, and Canis familiaris, the dog, is the offspring of the extant Canis lupus, that is, the wolf. So that's a kind of um, fantasy about auroxes and cows. And that is the dog and the wolf. Those, in fact, could not interbreed without help. Um, 200 years ago, in the freewheeling days, uh, early days of systematic zoology, domesticated animal kinds were frequently allotted their own genera with breeds or do of dogs or cattle consequently elevated to the level of species or subspecies. But of course, potency does not necessarily produce or require clarity. Although the categories of wild and domesticated are implicitly opposed, and they have been in England, English for a thousand years, if you replace domestic with its Germanic predecessor, tame, um, Drawing the line between them, or to put it another way, establishing mutually exclusive definitions have never been easy. Many animals, and even more plants, have inevitably remained tantalizingly ambiguous or ambivalent. There are several factors that contribute to this persistent imprecision. Some are scientific, deriving ultimately from what I said before, the elusiveness of an abstract definition of species and others, at least equally influential, reflect cultural notions about categories and relative value. As a result, the increasingly sophisticated analytical tools of modern biological science haven't always made things much clearer, especially since additional information doesn't inevitably indicate how that information is to pri be prioritized. That is to say, which characteristics are the most significant ones with regard to classification. So in particular, although domesticated animals are routinely denominated as species separate from their wild ancestors, the theory behind this widespread practice has been elusive. The guidance offered on this point by the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature, which by its own declaration acts as advisor and arbiter for the zoological community by disseminating and generating information on the correct use of the scientific names of animals is not particularly firm. And this is their process, which you can see uh, has, its, has its gaps. Nevertheless, taxonomists continue to stress the importance of maintaining separate binomials, not only for reasons of intellectual clarity, but also because in many cases, both the lived experience and the legal status of the two forms are very different. Such decisiveness prescribes a clear course of action, but it leaves the underlying questions unanswered. Or perhaps implicit answers are based on surprising grounds. For example, a recent article uh, it has three ta distinguished taxonomists arguing that since wild species and their derivatives are recognizable entities, it's desirable to separate them nomenclaturally where distinct names exist. So in this formulation, the key term recognizable refers to judgments that interested laypersons can make as confidently or as provisionally 
as can specialists. The four main characteristics of domesticated animals that they specify allow plenty of room for individual judgment or for argument. So they say breeding controlled by humans, provision of a useful product or service, tameness and selection away for the, from the wild type. And it's worth noticing that they actually don't mention the conventional, though problematic, criterion about hybridization. So one of the commonest kinds of pets thus provides an example of the definitional difficulties that may remain or emerge. So most people would not think twice about characterizing house cats as domesticated. But the authors of a different article adding 5,000 years to their historical association with humans based on both DNA and archaeological evidence hedge their bets. They answer the questions, are today's cats truly domesticated with notable, I would say, restraint? Although they satisfy the criterion of tolerating people, most domestic cats are feral, this is more true here than in the US, and do not rely on people to feed them or to find them mates. The average domesticated cat largely retains the wild body plant. That's what they say. They don't say anything about useful products or services. Um, so these quotations have been taken from articles published in scientific journals, so their authors don't commit themselves with regard to whether this ambiguous status is a good thing or a bad thing. But this kind of ostensible objectivity hasn't characterized everyone with an interest in whether a particular animal or group of animals belongs to a domesticated species or a wild one. Over time, while the desire to distinguish between wild forms and their domesticated relatives has remained constant, the valence of this distinction has shifted significantly. So the 18th century practice of labeling breeds as species <coughs> simultaneously celebrated and reified the power of domestication and it might also enhance the cash value of breeds. But an alternative to the traditional preference for domestication was already at that time emerging. So along with the first flush of the Romantic movement, wildness gained in cachets, at least from some privileged perspective. Which is not to say that wildness has definitively triumphed in every context. And in fact, one explanation for the difficulty of distinguishing between wild and domesticated species is that more or less identical animals can seem very different depending on their circumstances. So the modern pit bull is the latest in a series of dogs. The predecessors include the bulldog, the German shepherd or Alsatian, the Doberman pincher, that have been appreciated initially for their ferocity or other qualities associated with their wild relatives and subsequently for an appearance and a temperament that retains some of the cachet of toughness without any of its danger. And here are two versions of the modern pit bull. Such dual significance can be conveyed by animals that begin as wild, as well as by those that begin as domesticated. For example, breeding offers an abstract way to overlay wildness with the trappings of domestication. As the untrammeled reproductive options historically available to both house and barn cats have made them seem a little more wild, the application of the machinery of pedigree developed for elite domesticated breeds can make even tigers seem a little less so. This is the tiger stud book. And stud books like this have controlled the matings of zoo animals, and especially if they belong to species that have become scarce in the wild, for more than half a century now. The standard justification for this practice is to maintain genetic diversity and to avoid the inbreeding that may otherwise weaken small captive populations, but it also has been frequently used to reify the category of subspecies, that is to say, to maintain racial purity. And both agendas mean that zoo animals whose parentage is unknown may be precluded from breeding and zoo animals whose parentage is deemed to be inappropriate in some way may be precluded from breathing, like the unfortunate ma giraffe Marius, recently uh, deceased in the Copenhagen Zoo. So there's the live Marius, and here is the dead one. Um, the advent of 
DNA analysis in recent decades has made it both easier to distinguish wild species from domesticated ones and more difficult. For example, the Scottish Wildcat Association was established in 2007 to protect the small remaining uh, British subpopulation of the very widely distributed species that's ancestral to domesticated cats. The targeted felines strongly resemble tabbies, although they tend to be larger and more irascible. Perhaps for this reason, the distinction between pure wild animals and those contaminated by miscegenation features prominently on the association's website. It says, in 2004, a team of scientists estimated that 400 wildcats remained, the other 5,000 or so being feral domestic cats or hybrid mixes of domestic and wildcat. It further advocated improving legal protection, launch, launching a public awareness campaign, supporting the captive breeding program, and creating special reserves for wildcats, which would in turn benefit many other species. As a result, the Scottish wildcat has been declared a priority species, at least in Scotland, and become eligible to benefit from the establishment of a stud book, a captive breeding program, and other measures that blur the cultural boundary between the wild and the domesticated, even as they attempt to reinforce the genetic boundary that separates them. On the other hand, if you've been following the wildcat news, um, it's recently been reported a, a plan to breed hybrids uh, in Devon and release them once they're producing 150 kittens a year. And this is a plan that has the implicit approval of the International Union for the Conservation of, of Nature, which finds the current Scottish population unsustainable. As far as I know, the Scottish Wildcat Association hasn't uh, expressed an opinion about this. Now, the case of the American bison, to conclude, is still more puzzling. Having teetered on the bridge of extinction in the late 19th century, it's become one of the success stories of modern species preservation. So although their free-ranging uh, populations remain far below their historical maximum, so they're now in the tens of thousands as, composed to es of, as opposed to estimates that range as high as uh, 50 million, Bisons are now sufficiently uh, numerous to be eaten undiluted as bison burgers uh, or in hybrid hybridized form as beefalo burgers. And the name itself indicates the hybrid, uh, hybrid descent of the source of the beefalo burger, which is crosses between the American bison, that is bison bison, and the domestic cow, both taurus. That's a beefalo. But the relation of contemporary bison to the noble former inhabitants of the Great Plains is far from straightforward. The animals who end up in fast food restaurants and grocery stores definitely come from domesticated stock, not from the wild herds that roam in places like Yellowstone National Park. But it appears that beneath their reassuring demographic success, even many of the apparently wild bison populations may be similarly compromised. That is, the impressive herds of bison that wander around the preserved and protected landscapes of the American West, if you've ever seen them, they look like wild bison and they act like wild bison. They seem indistinguishable from the iconic beast who formerly um, adorned the American nickel. There are some of them. But an article in the Sierra Club's magazine pointedly celebrated the 3,700, that is a small subset, Yellowstone bison as free of cattle genes, our last wild bison. And the reason they said that is because despite their reassuring phenotype, most of the current wild American bison in public herds as well as in private herds turn out to include substantial genetic contributions from domesticated cattle, possibly produced as a result of decisions on the part of the cattle and bison themselves before the range was fenced in. So at least in theory, and if it's assumed, it's assumption, that genotype trumps phenotype, this raises substantial questions about exactly what has been saved and why. <laughs>